Acts chapter 6. Acts 6. Acts chapter 6. Uh, y'all guys, men's, don't forget Thursday night. We got our uh, men's supper uh, at a faithful Baptist church. And it's going to be at 6.30. From what I hear, they got smoked pork chops. But even if it ain't that, it'll still be good, I'm sure. But uh, y'all come on out, and uh, in case I, not you, men's. Yeah, okay. yeah, don't go there. Don't go there. But, uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, y'all remember where we was at last week in the first part of chapter 6, where it was uh, talking about seven men were chosen uh, to uh, handle tables. In other words, make sure everybody had enough to eat because there was a little contention amongst uh, the Hellenists, which are the Greek, the 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 Jews that came from Greece, and they were being uh, neglected. I don't think it was intentional, but they, it, it just happened. You know, things happen sometimes. And so the, the deacon, I mean the apostles decided, look, it ain't right, you know, that, that we give up doing what we're doing right here, you know, to make sure uh, uh, everybody's got enough to eat. We got other people that can do that. Well, so they got uh, they got these brothers, pick them out. It doesn't say anything about deacons right here, but that's what they uh, came to be known as. And so they went about it. And as we see something here about Stephen, I, I want to just I think because he wasn't around very long in in this part of Acts or in the Bible that. We, we don't really see what an extraordinary man he really was because he didn't stay in there long enough. God took him. But Stephen, he was doing all these things the apostles was doing. He was preaching, and he was also seeing after the, the needs of, uh, of everybody else because that's, he was the first one when the people voted, he was the first one they chose. So he already had him a reputation in the church. Uh, and it says here in verse 8, he says, uh, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So he was, he was participating in the miracles. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it is called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. Now there's something interesting about this. Something I can't prove, but I have read about it. But first, the freedmen, these were supposedly uh, uh, Jews who had, from other places that had uh, received Roman citizenship. I think. That's, that's what they say. Cyrenians, uh, you remember uh, the guy that carried, uh, 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 who was it, that carried Jesus' cross? Was he Cyrene or was he from Cyprus? But it don't really matter, matter about that. He was from uh, some Cyrenians. Alexandrians, they were from uh, Egypt, the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Cilicia and Asia, which could be Turkey, but now Cilicia, Cilicia, if you want to call it. Uh, what's interesting about that is uh, it's told in the histories from, from where they've read that a lot of people came from Cilicia and moved to Jerusalem because they were good with working bronze. And they were working, uh, repairing, there's actually a, like a, a work order for them to come down there and repair a bell, a, a bronze bell in Jerusalem. And so they 
A lot of them started coming down there living there, and they just found more and more work. There's a work order for uh, working on a bronze uh, uh, mortar and pedestal that had a crack in it. And so they're doing all this work. But, but the more interesting thing is they had 500, uh, almost 500 synagogues in Jerusalem. And a lot of them were these people from different places found in their own synagogues. You know, Jerusalem was a very metropolitan city at this time. People came from all over, mostly Jews, but uh, uh, everywhere. But anyhow, the Cilicia, guess what the biggest city in Cilicia was? Tarsus. So a lot of people, well, it's believed that that was the synagogue that Saul probably attended is the one from Tarsus. Those those were his people. And you see the you've got all these people coming from different places, Jews, but coming from dis- different places out of different synagogues. They rose up while Stephen was preaching and disputed with them. So Saul was probably in this bunch right here. And he might have been the ringleader, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking he was. But it doesn't say outright it was. But I'll tell you later why I think it was. And it says, then they, uh, uh, it says, they rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. He was speaking from the Holy Spirit, and they couldn't, they couldn't stand it. They, they couldn't dispute with him. Uh, you remember how they used to try to get Jesus all the time? You know, they'd even quote scriptures to them. They never got Jesus. They never got him. They always had to withdraw. And did they learn anything from them? Nope, they just got mad. You know, when somebody just gets mad and storms off over the word, just keep that in mind. When somebody gets mad like that and uh, they don't want to hear what you have to say or hear what the word wants to say, just keep that in mind. Uh, so anyhow, so this is what they resorted to. Then they secretly instigated men. So anyhow, they were going around getting men to do stuff. Instigated men uh, who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So they had people starting rumors. You know, this kind of stuff still goes on to this day. They got people behind the scenes to start rumors, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, you know, all the big religious uh, potentates around there, I guess you can call them, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses. They got liars. How about that? Who said, uh, huh? Paid liars. Yeah, paid liars. Uh, And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Okay. He kind of did. (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, uh, we'll just go ahead with that uh, they didn't like it and then this was interesting to me it says and gazing at him all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel I've always wondered what that mean, meant so I've kind of read up on it uh, they looked at him and no matter what they said about him what they saw was innocence. innocence and a man who was speaking the truth and he knew he was speaking the truth and he was you know he couldn't have cared less what they thought about it you know he wasn't he wasn't against them he had just been telling them the truth and and he wasn't worried he was not concerned he had the face of an angel and when people looked on him i think they were awestruck because of his whole demeanor i think it's it just his whole demeanor he didn't look frightened 
uh, he looked uh, proud ain't the right word, but he was sticking to his guns no matter what, you know, and uh, he, he was going to hold to it. He was going to hold to it. Yeah. I imagine he did the same thing as uh, but the same way Stephen did it's like That's right. Yeah. Y'all gonna do what you're gonna do. When he was standing up there for pilot, you know, it was the same thing. <clears throat> so ver, uh, chapter seven it says the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. Now this is a little long speech right here, but it's important. When you remember that he was in the, they were in the temple, or had been in the temple, and he was being accused of saying that the Lord was going to destroy this temple. And, and less than 40 years later, as a matter of fact, that temple was going to be destroyed. And I've told y'all before, you, you've seen the gold dome in Jerusalem, the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. It's a, a Muslim place. That's the exact place where the temple used to sit. The foundations are, are still there, and the, some of the retaining walls are still there, but the temple was uh, destroyed all the way to the ground. But uh, so this is this is where this is going on. So this is this is what he why he gives us long history right here. But it's interesting enough, so I'm just going to read it, and let's just stick with it and hear it out. And so the high priest said, "Are these things so?" And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Remember when we went through Genesis, we went all through this. And said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but guaranteed to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them four hundred years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave them, uh, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, Jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, a great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, seventy-five persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Sechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. 
He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and as he drew near to look, there came a voice, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals for your feet from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man sent, man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him but thrust him aside and in their hearts they turned to Egypt. I like the way he said that. They weren't going to Egypt physically, but their hearts had turned back there. And uh, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifice during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Rephan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. In fact, the idol Moloch was the one that uh, they sacrificed uh, their firstborn children to. And they were taking up the religion of the nations around them. And I think, according to this, that they were already doing that when they were in the wilderness. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, and just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God, and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. Now here he's getting down to the nitty gritty. He's talking about the temple. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is my place of rest? Did not my things make all these things? Did not my hand make all these things? See, he's talking about the temple now. That they were, they were looking up in awe to the temple and utmost reverence and not realizing, you know, that God isn't going to be in a place like that. Yeah. He directed Solomon to build that temple, and he directed David to prepare it for Solomon to build. But this this was just a place where God chose to reside with them. It was not, you know, it was not in itself the place, you know. And but but when when uh, they were talking about when Jesus said, you know, all these 
stones are going to, there won't be one left on top of another, you know, which came true. They just, they couldn't handle that, you know, because they put more reverence on the building than they did God. And uh, that's what kind of stuff that human beings tend to do. Okay, so he got through all this. He's telling them all this. And then he gets to the part. Uh, he starts preaching that hot fire to them, Terry. Says now, uh, he's, huh? Stiff neck people. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous ones, the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Mm. Ain't that right? That's what they did. Verse 54. Before we get into this part, anybody got something they want to say or add? Now here, this great man of God, you know, you would think, why would God take him in his prime? Well, because he wanted to. Stephen was the first martyr of the Christian church. And you can all think, well, he was doing so much. You know, he was such a... Uh, a, a great figure in the Christian church. Why would God do that? Well, you let the Lord worry about that. I mean, uh, uh, I've I've known a lot of people. Well, I've I've known some people. I remember hearing one time about a family that actually uh, went to Afghanistan of all places. And uh, this has been a few years back, probably ten years ago or so. You know, who would do that? <laughs> You know, unless you're called by God, I guess. They went to Afghanistan was going to preach the gospel. And uh, she got extremely sick. And they had to come home and that wound it up. Uh, I've also known people that were preparing for the mission field and died before they could ever go. I've, I've heard them stories. You don't know what God's going to do. You don't know who he's going to take out of this world, when he's going to do it. Uh or even why. Or even why. But he knows why. But let's just read more about this man of God here. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. Man, I'm telling you, when you go to grinding them teeth, you done got really mad. It's fixing to get rough. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. Yes. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. There's something I want to say about this before we go forward. Stephen saw Jesus, the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God. The heavens opened. God allowed him to see this. Yes. Now you think about it. Over and over in the New Testament, if you look back at it, and I don't have all the scriptures, I've read them, but you can Google it sitting at the right hand of God, and it'll show you all of them. There's numerous. But look right here. It says, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Yeah. Now, I think that the Lord was sitting down, and when Stephen was about to get stoned to death, yeah, I think the Lord stood up. Yeah. Jesus stood up. You know, and it's like, come on, Stephen. Yeah. You know, hey, I'm here with you, and I'm going to see when you get here. Yes. And it's going to be real quick. Yes. It's, it's going to be very soon. That's what I believe. Jesus was sitting at the right hand of God, and he saw what was about to happen to Stephen, knew all about it, was already aware of it. And I think he stood up and was giving tribute to Stephen for what he was doing and what he was Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. 
And then when he said that, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Yeah. They cried out with a loud voice. You know, it was all like a crowd roar is what I'm thinking. They all, you know, like uh, when when uh, Georgia scores a touchdown, you know, everybody, it sounded like one voice. Sometimes I bet I've been to some of these games that it sounded like a roar. I mean, really loud. But it says, uh, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together. In other words, they, they don't want to hear that. It, that was cutting them to the heart, not just the ears. It was going, it was going through them ears and to their heart and cutting them like a knife. Well, they couldn't stand it. <clears throat> Sir? Well, I found it interesting uh, when he said that he, uh, he saw Jesus at the right hand of God. And he said, that really on. Um, That's right. He did not like that at all. That's right. Jamie, Jamie was mentioning how when he said the Son of Man uh, standing at the right hand of God, what really made him mad is he was saying that Jesus was equal to God. You know, and that, you know, that just lit him up right there. And uh, I don't even know if equal to God is the right word. He is God. And and they're all God, and uh, we're not here to talk about the Trinity right now, because you know that's something that our minds cannot fathom. I just I just believe it. Uh, okay. Then they uh, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Something else I thought about: they cast him out of the city where they had to take him from the temple. Or, or wherever they were at in there, to either the temple or at, uh, the council meeting place, and carry them all the way out of town. And you can believe they weren't, you know, handling them with kid gloves on the way out. No. They were beating the snot at them on the way out, too, I promise you. Then they get out there and stone them. Huh? No, they really, they didn't. Uh, the Romans... And they all knew that, you know, that they didn't have that authority. That was the whole thing with Jesus when they, uh, the uh, council of uh, the uh, Sanhedrin, or Sanhedrin, however you pronounce it, the 70 members of the Jewish council, they knew that when they took Jesus to see uh, Pilate. Pilate said, why do you bring him here to me? And they said, because we don't have the authority to execute them. Only you can give that. But they were so enraged and mad right here, they just took them out there and, and stoned them to death, which really the Romans did not care. They didn't care. But they just, uh, with Jesus, they just wanted to make sure, since he was such a huge figure, uh, uh, they didn't start any trouble. So anyhow... It says, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. You know, uh, Saul had been there long enough to see kind of what was going on, but this, this really set him off right here. I, I don't believe he's never mentioned when Jesus is, uh, in, is around, but I think sometime after Jesus died, he showed up or was resurrected. I think he showed up at some time. I think he's seen some of these miracles that Stephen was doing. And he's the one that got involved, I, I believe, in, uh, uh, in you know, making all these accusations of Stephen. I think he's one of them that ground his teeth. I think he's one of them that stopped up his ears. I think he was enraged. And he was put, fixing to put a whole lot of action behind that rage. But it started here. It doesn't say he stoned him. But I think he was a very influential figure in Jerusalem because all the younger men, uh, or all the men, they came and laid down their feet, uh, laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. In other words, they took off these outer garments, sort of like taking off your jacket and rolling up your sleeves so you can really uh, get to work. And they stoned him to death. Saul was right there. The whole thing of them laying there. Uh, uh, garments down there beside him, he was a witness. He was a witness to this. 
and he went along with it. He was he was totally in favor of this. So, you know, I guess uh, nowadays they would be he would be you know uh, tried for murder as an accomplice. That's hard to imagine. That's the same guy. Yeah. But it is. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And the Lord was standing there waiting on him, standing up, waiting on him. Right. Praise the Lord. And following to, falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That last prayer of his, do not hold this sin against them, that sounds just like Jesus, doesn't Jesus. it? Yep. Mercy. And Christ. I don't know how things turned out with all the stoners, but I know the Lord showed mercy to Saul. Yes, he did. Not yet. But uh, we are not going to go any further, but if you'll notice right there in the uh, beginning of chapter 8, verse 1, it said, And Saul approved of his execution. He was right there with him. So I think Saul had a great deal of influence. He was a young man. But as far as uh, as far as uh, one of the religious Pharisees yeah. in Jerusalem, he was an up and comer yes. at this time, and uh, he backed up everything he believed uh, very very violently. And uh, from that day on, there arose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and uh, we'll read more about this yeah. later on. Anybody got anything they want to add or questions? I just, I wanted to say that whenever you explain that about God usually sits and he's standing here for Stephen, like that's no lump in my brain because that just like makes me, and I wish it for everybody else to just live a life so pleasing to God that he stands up mm -hmm. for all the way to see him. You know, it's just kind of, that all over me. And I like, uh, like, Stephen had uh, mercy on his mm -hmm. killers. And, and I, you know, if we want to be like Jesus, we have to have mercy and grace yeah. on people who offend us. That's right. Instead of walking around with bad resentments, let's have mercy and grace just like Jesus. That's right. Also, ma'am. Is that right? Friday night's lesson in CR. Yes. So uh, uh, we're not going to get into chat rate, right, but I do want to point out something else in the, uh, verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Stephen, I think at this point already, uh, uh, from what I understand, the church had already grown there between twenty and 30,000 people in the church already. They had seven deacons. I, you know, Let's call them deacons. Kind of like Bobby here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, add another couple thousand people. Yeah. Though. <laughs> Feed me! <laughs> but, uh... uh called Diane and Gail deacons, too. Yeah. Uh... But the thing, it says, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. No, no longer than the church had been here, this man had already made a huge influence in the church. Yes. A huge influence. And, uh, uh, but he was gone so quickly. I mean, he came in and he made an impact and he's gone. And that's all God's doing. But the thing about it is, you know, it's not the amount of time you spend in this world making an influence for the Lord. It's what you do with the time He gives you. You know, purpose. that's right. Uh, if you get saved and the Lord takes you next week, one person mm -hmm. full Christ. That's you. right. I remember when I was in high school, a young boy, I, I wasn't living for the Lord. But this guy was. He went to my school. He really was. And, uh, I mean, 
he was on fire, and, and he'd come around and witness to me, had his Bible and all that, and, and some of us others, and and he was a good guy, you know, and, and I was under conviction a lot of times around him. But before we graduated, I think it was, uh, it was in my senior year, he got killed in a hit-and-run accident. They never found the guy who did it. But he was gone. But the reason I thought of him was because of the influence he had for such a short time. Yeah. You know, he hadn't been a Christian that long, maybe a year. You but know, look at Jesus' ministry. Three years. Three years. That's right. So some people go a lifetime and never do nothing for the Lord. You know, never do nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Anybody have anything else they'd like to add? All right. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this night for your word. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to to continue to study this word that's that's been out there, Lord, for so long. Thousands of years. Lord, it still has meaning to us to this day because it's your word. Lord, I pray that you'll just help us, God, to to uh, let it enter our hearts and stay there in the time of need. And God, I just pray also that a uh, for those that have come to know you recently, recently joined the church, God, I, I pray you'll help us to be good mentors to them and uh, and be there to strengthen them and help them when we can. And Lord, be with us the rest of this week. Keep us safe, Lord. Uh, help the ladies uh, to be safe on their journey to Alaska. And uh, I just pray, God, you keep your hands on them, help them to have a good time while they're gone and fellowship with each other and uh, just bless us as we go forward. I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me.